Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition, our Let's Play series against Lieutenant Rainbow Slash. It is March 26th of 1942, and we are going to see how uh, a pretty big attack that we have planned in the Philippines ends up shaking out. Uh, we have uh, planned to try and break out of Bataan. There are only two Japanese divisions located there, and we know at least one of them is in motion based on our intelligence last turn. So the intent is to hit them in motion, and maybe we can give them a bit of a bloody nose while, uh, while our troops in Bataan are all going to eventually die. The hope is that we can uh, hurt the Japanese enough to maybe make their sacrifice worth uh, something. Meanwhile, it looks like the Japanese have moved a task force in along the coast of Java. Uh, three destroyers and a light cruiser engaging five, actually six of our patrol boats here. So presumably this is the start of the invasion of Java. Uh, the Japanese have, I think, three or four more days, basically till the end of March, to actually unload troops with a massive advantage. And so if they wait till after March, troops unload much more slowly, which makes amphibious operations substantially more challenging. So it makes sense that they would make a move to try and land on Java, one of the last major islands that they really need to take to kind of keep up with historical Japan or even surpass historical Japan. You can see here we've got a surface engagement going on at night at close range with these PT boats. I had hoped that maybe they would get in close enough uh, to lose some torpedoes, but apparently not. Um, it doesn't seem to be going very well so far. We've lost one PT boat, another is on fire, likely to sink, and they're bracketing a third PT boat. Uh, actually, they just got a hit on a fourth PT boat here. So uh, let's go ahead and fast forward through this and see uh, what it looks like. Um, okay, so three of our PT boats were sunk. We didn't score a single hit on the enemy. But I guess maybe they expended some ammunition? I guess that might be a good thing. And I'm sorry if I'm yawning a little bit here, guys. It's been a really long day, long week as well. So I did want to stream tonight, but I am a little bit fatigued, so you may get, catch an occasional yawn here or there. All right, so it looks like our task force is trying to pull up, pull out. Meanwhile, one of our submarines, a swordfish, fired a torpedo at, I think that was a Japanese light cruiser there. Uh, off the Java, in the Java Sea, but it uh, didn't hit anything, and now it's under attack from Japanese depth charges. Or destroyers, dropping depth charges. So we'll fast forward through that. Doesn't look like any hits, so we did launch four torpedoes at the Kuma, uh, which is, it looks like they've got a task force here with two light cruisers and four destroyers. Um in the heart of the Java Sea. Uh, unfortunately, our torpedoes all missed and the swordfish bottomed out and was not damaged. Meanwhile, Japanese submarine attacking our tanker, the Strix, which we were trying to get out of Java. She was loaded with like 6,000 fuel, so at least that's fuel Japan won't get. But uh, you can see here that she's gonna go down. Japanese are attacking her on the surface at night. Uh, maybe the best thing we can say is we, they may use up some, may use up some uh, torpedoes here. Uh, yeah, F, F for sure. But hey, man, four torpedoes. <laughs> a little bit of an overkill here. Uh, the Japanese submarine wasted four torpedoes on her. Probably two would have done. All right, so the Strix sinks and the captain of the ship is killed. Hey, Southern, how you doing? We just got started. We lost a tanker south of Java. Meanwhile, the Japanese have swept forward from uh, in towards Semarang to uh, try and clean out our patrol boats at Semarang, and they did sink three of our patrol boats there. We are going to be attacking at Bataan uh, later on in this uh, turn, so you haven't missed a lot. It's still the nighttime AM phase. Who's skippering that sub, Wolfpack? Uh, you know, no comment. I'm sure Wolfpack 345 would never be skippering such an ineffective submarine. Uh, okay, so we're into the AM phase now, AM air phase. You can see a lot of recon going on here, some naval reaction as well. Uh, some fast transports moving around in the Solomons. Uh, not a lot of, well, actually. So another task force engages our PT boats. I'm not sure if that's the same task force, but it looks like we've got a, a, a AM operation here where the task forces are maneuvering for operation, or for 
for position. We're at 4,000 yards. I would think that's inside range uh, to be able to launch torpedoes. It looks like the Allies actually gained uh, tactical position here on the Japanese. Um, but I guess we'll fast forward here. I don't know if any torpedoes get launched. Sounded like maybe one torpedo was launched. You can see here another one of our PT boats is hit and sunk. Low visibility due to rain. You would think that would have helped the PT boats out. But um, they got another one of our PT boats. So two of them are still alive. Four of them had now been sunk. The rest of them look like they're pulling back toward Japan. Meanwhile, another Japanese submarine here off the U.S. West Coast is hitting the... Uh, cargo ship John Fremont, which I think was heading up toward Anchorage with some supplies that are badly needed up there. Um, and so two torpedoes into that and it will sink. Alright, so it does look like there are Japanese uh, carrier planes that are reconning around Java. We've got a bunch of Kates that have been spotted. Reconning some of our different ships in the area. So I do think we, we spotted what looked like it was the Japanese Mini Kitty Butai in the Java Sea last turn. We'll have to take a look and see where that is. Meanwhile, some ships down near Denzapar as well. Um, they may be landing there also. Quite a few different task forces operating in the Java Sea at the moment. I did order my 27 or so Dutch medium bombers, uh, Boston's and Mitchell's, to fly out of Batavia and try and hit the Japanese forces there. Um, haven't seen them moving yet. It looks like the Japanese are sweeping out over Batavia with A6M20. So uh, good thing we didn't have our cap flying there. Meanwhile, 19 Bettys are hitting Sorbaya. Uh, Simster, I don't have a good answer to the stream schedule. I try to stream around 9 o'clock Central Standard Time when I'm able. Uh, there's been a lot that's been going on over the last couple of weeks in my real life uh, that have made being a regular schedule pretty difficult, but I do hope to establish a regular schedule in 2020. We'll see, though. You know, Newhauser, there might be one that I follow. I guess, you know, what I would like to do is stream three days a week at 9 o'clock Central Standard Time and maybe the occasional weekend stream during a normal hour, but generally somewhere between 9 to 10 o'clock Central Standard Time is going to be my, my normal streaming time. All right, so the Japanese are hitting survey. Uh, remember, we do have uh, a fair number of bombing and patrol aircraft on the ground there. They are doing some damage there. Uh, to those aircraft, but our best aircraft are all up at Batavia, which they have not started to bomb yet. They have definitely swept very heavily over there. He, I think he learned his lesson with our Hurricanes and Warhawks, giving him a bit of a bloody nose against his Oscars a few turns back. Twenty B5N1 Kates are hitting Ambon. Where are they flying out of? Did he base them out of... Did he drop them off a carrier and put them at Kendari or something? They're hitting the uh, the troops there at Amb Ambon. Meanwhile, 23 KI-51 Sonyas flying out of what I assume is Manila, since I don't think he has any troops at Clark Field, uh, to hit our uh, troops at Batan. Hopefully they don't disrupt our planned attack all that, all that much here before we get into that phase. Another 18 Sonyas coming in. So it looks like he's probably got at least 40 or 50 of those things based. We did get one of them destroyed there by Flak. All right, meanwhile, I made the mistake of not canceling my Chinese bombing raid on Quilin. I, I should have canceled it. That's three turns in a row. It looks like uh, Lieutenant Rainbow Slash finally learned his lesson there, and he's got a, a cap of Nates up here against these things. So they made it through. The Nate isn't really powerful enough to completely shut them down, but they definitely shot a couple down there as you see our SB3s dropping payloads on the, on the Chinese or Japanese forces there, and then they're getting intercepted on their way out. Looks like we lost six planes damaged, one destroyed. Uh, meanwhile, we did still inflict 35 casualties on the Japanese. Simster, this is part of the series against XTRG, but XTRG is no longer our opponent. 
Uh, XTRG had to bow out due to some real life time constraints, uh, and he handed the save over to Lieutenant Rainbow Slash. So that is our current opponent in the game. See you, Peninsula Wars 1. Thanks for coming out. Sorry you couldn't stick around longer. Okay. All right. Whoa. That looked like there were like 60 or so aircraft attacking at Semarain. It only has 27 Nels, but it, it looked like there's a large number of 31 Zeros, 27 Nels, 21 Oscars. You can see the aircraft are coming from two directions. I'm assuming... I can't... I really wish I could move this... Okay, so it looks like probably the Nels are coming out of Borneo, just based off of what we know about where the previous attacks have been. And I'm guessing the Zeros and Oscars are coming out of Palembang. I suppose they could be coming out of this task force. We'll have to see what this task force south of uh, Tubali is. But otherwise, they're probably coming out of Palembang. I'm guessing he's got some naval, naval air units with Zeros, as well as the Army air units with Oscars based out of Palembang. Bunch more recon. Let's see what's going on here. All right, so Japanese are landing troops at Denzapar. You can see they're coming off of cargo ships. It looks like they might have a destroyer escort, but not a huge force. We don't. I think all we have is a base force unit there, so they're definitely going to take that base. Um, what are they landing? It doesn't say what's unloading, or at least I didn't see what it said. Uh, they do lose 20 casualties, so one squad destroyed in uh, accidents here, so they weren't properly prepped for landing at that base. Meanwhile, we can see here light cruisers bombarding the troops at Semarang. Again, I think all we have is a base force unit there, but the, the defenders lose 123 casualties, all non-combatants. Again, I don't think we even have any combatants there. They're unloading over the beach, and the Japanese lose 306 casualties. Woof. Looks like they're landing elements of the 4th Division. Um, and then also some Naval Guard unit. A couple of Naval Guard units, and the rest is just of the 4th Division. So, so far, elements of one Imperial Japanese Army Division. 306 casualties, mostly, I think, from dudes just drowning. Looks, you can see these troops are lost from a landing craft uh, that are crashing and whatnot uh, during the, the landing operation. So 4th Division is not properly prepped, which means they're having a bunch of accidents due to not really being ready for this particular operation, not knowing the beach, not knowing the ground. So 23 squads destroyed, uh, 14 combatant, 9 non-combatant. That's a nice little, little hit to them. Yeah, Pat, I assume it's a rushed invasion job. You can see now we've got some heavy cruisers getting into the act, bombarding after the troops went ashore. Whoops. Um, but I'm assuming it's rushed because he's trying to get this done before uh, the end of March. Because remember, he loses his invasion bonus on April 1st. Okay, 217 casualties for the defenders. Man, they must be getting obliterated there. I don't think I have much in the way of defenders there. Another 100 casualties lost by the Japanese. Another nine squads destroyed. Two more guns lost in uh, landing. It looks like they're also landing the 24th Infantry Regiment and the 144th Infantry Regiment. So, so far we've seen two infantry regiments and one division landing, as well as some artillery support with the 5th Mortar Battalion and uh, the two Naval Guard units that we saw landing. He's also landing some troops at Benkalas. Again, he's rushing to get all of these things taken care of while he still has his benefits uh, with the, the amphibious benefits. We don't really have anything to oppose him in any of these places, but just interesting to watch, I guess. And we're into the ground combat phase. So Japanese bombardment at Quilin. You can see here they have four divisions in place with a couple of headquarters and one artillery unit. We've got, I think, enough to hold, hopefully anyway, versus that force that he's got. Um, he bombarded us and actually lost more than... So the defensive artillery inflicted 135 casualties against him. We only lost 10. One squad destroyed on our end, two on his end. So that, that, that tilts in our favor. That's always a good sign when the defender loses less than the attacker on a bombardment. 
and Japanese bombardment at Chusin. This will be a different story. These Chinese troops are basically all out of supply. Although we didn't really lose much in that bombardment. Deliberate attack at Jinjabi on the island of Sumatra. He'll drive us back there. 124th Infantry Regiment. Didn't we see the 124th landing on, on Java? If that's the case, then he split the regiment. The majority of the regiment must still be here, though. He lost 109 casualties. Oh, one, I'm confusing the 124th and the 144th. Okay. Japanese bombardment attack on Kaigan. First, first thing we've seen him do anything in the Philippines uh, on Mindanao. Remember, uh, XTRG had launched several failed attacks on Mindanao, so you can see he's testing us out here to see what we still have in place. Uh, I, I don't know if he has enough strength to overwhelm us here or not. Our supply situation is abysmal, um, but his troops have been pretty badly shattered in a couple of failed attacks there. So you can see here 10 casualties on his end. We didn't lose anything in that bombardment. So again, that may dissuade him uh, by the fact that his bombardment did nothing. And here we go, boys. Here is the moment of truth. The 16th and 33rd Imperial Japanese Divisions uh, up against the might of the American and Filipino forces attacking out of Bataan, trying to break out, trying to potentially drive for Clark Field. A shock attack launched by our troops. Our supply situation isn't great. Uh, we're under 10,000 supply left. We likely have a couple of weeks left that we can hold out, but he has not brought enough troops to subdue us. So he's basically, you know, or at least XTRG, was hoping to starve us out with minimal investment of his own troops. We are trying to punish him for that uh, to see what happens here. So as these, uh, as these numbers drop, it'll indicate how successful the attack is or isn't. You can see here our different units are attacking. Um, you can see the 4th Marine Regiment there is attacking. You can see 73 assault value down for the Marines down here. Meanwhile, his units are losing a fair bit of their uh, their value here. We'll see how much it drops. Now, the other key thing is, even if we push him back, the question is going to be whether we can pursue through to Clark Field. Uh, if we don't do enough damage, we may not be able to effectively pursue him. But really, it's kind of a, an all-or-nothing thing here at this point, is sort of if we drive him back, I think we're going to pursue anyway because we're going to burn so much of our supply, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to attack and then not pursue. So you can see here his his numbers are dropping pretty substantially. The, the 16th Division has lost almost 200 assault value. Yep, they're retreating, they're retreating. We win! Yes! Okay. So you can see here that we had 1970 assault value. He had just shy of 900. Um, the adjusted, because of our headquarters bonuses and our prep bonuses, bumps us up to 3,400. His bonus was at 1,100 because of the defensive terrain. You can see here the combat modifiers. The defender gets terrain, but they lose some of their uh, modifiers because they were disrupted, and their experience of these units apparently is low which is interesting that these divisions are low experience. Meanwhile, we get a plus bonus for a shock attack. We end up with two to one odds, and we inflict 10,000 casualties on the Japanese forces. We do lose 5,000 of our own, but I think the important thing to remember here is all of our troops are going to die eventually. Like in the next few weeks, they're all going to surrender for sure. So we inflicted almost 10,000 casualties, over 200 squads destroyed of his combat forces, another 156 disabled. He also lost 201 non-combatant squads and 97 disabled, 20 engineer squads destroyed and 31 disabled, 53 guns, 18 of those destroyed, 19 vehicles, 9 of those destroyed, and those two divisions is pushed back. So 200 squads destroyed that if we had just sat around and waited to starve would have never been destroyed. Two divisions that are largely... I don't know if we can say they're wrecked, but 210 squads, that's half a division. Um, you know, the disabled squads, he'll get those back more quickly. But in terms of the destroyed, we basically destroyed half a Japanese division. Uh, we, we put a big hurt on two of his divisions' uh, ability to be effective. Likely we'll want to pull them out of combat for a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so, uh, maybe two months to get all those losses replaced. So that, that should hurt him more than just having him sit around for a few weeks. Um, so, hey, you know what? I think uh, I think that's a good result. We did lose 91 squads, destroyed 440 disabled. That's going to hurt on the offensive, especially when we're going to move into Clark Field where we won't have the offensive uh, bonus uh, for our, our prep. 
Uh, we did lose 135 guns, 51 destroyed, 126 vehicles, four of those destroyed, uh, 14 engineers, 105 disabled. So these disabled losses are going to hurt. The actual casualty figures aren't that bad. The destroyed figures aren't that bad. But these disabled figures, that's going to hurt real bad when we try and attack again, especially those engineer losses. Um, but nonetheless, we did drive them back from Batan and inflicted a bunch of casualties that they would not have otherwise lost. So the Japanese take Norman Normanby Island, southeast of uh, Port Moresby. Okay. All right, Emmer Island. So a bunch of just unoccupied islands that it looks like he's taking. And uh, I think that's going to do it for the turn. So we'll just have to go ahead and jump back in and see what uh, the situation looks like. We'll look at Batan first to see what uh, what the enemy has in store for us or what, what our troops look like coming out of that attack. What did it say about the battleship Prince of Wales? It said something about the Prince of Wales. Might have said like unable to repair further. She is she is in dry dock in South Africa. Oh, it's a refit. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and load this thing up and take a quick look. By the way, Tremors01, thank you very much for the sub. Appreciate the support. All right, so you can see Batan is clear of the enemy. We get a big red exclamation point. We're down to 2,200 supply. That's a problem. So we burned, I think, about 6,000 supply on that attack. That's harsh. Now, all of our units are still in good supply here. So you can see they all still have full full complements of supply, but we're, we've probably got one more effective attack in them before supply really starts to, to put a crimp on us. Meanwhile, if we take a look at some of the more important units, like the 4th Marine Regiment, half that regiment is now disabled, which is, is bad. The American units are much more effective attackers than the Filipino units, right or wrong. That's just the way the game models the Filipino units don't punch as hard. The American 31st Infantry Regiment is in a little bit better shape. You can see it's got 66 squads ready to attack. It looks like they probably lost not actually that many troops killed. They didn't lose any troops killed, actually, just 25 disabled. Um, in terms of what other units do we have in here? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of Filipino Army divisions. I'm not going to go through each one of those. But you can see these guys all, you know, the fair number of disabled throughout uh, all the different formations here. So quite a bit of casualties, but um, nonetheless, I think we're going to press forward and, and pursue to Batan. Uh, it's going to, or to Clark Field. It is going to be a tricky situation because Clark Field is JR Terrain, which JR Terrain is, where are we here, times three. It's jungle and rough. Um, the terrain that we were just fighting in is JG, which is slightly less um, ominous. It is uh, jung just jungle. So the terrain we were fighting in was times two for the defender. We're going to be moving into times three for the defender. Also, we don't know what his defenses look like at Clark Field. We don't know if XTRG built up forts or not in Clark Field. We're not really sure. Um, but we are going to pursue there nonetheless. You know, he's going to see that I'm moving to pursue. So I think, honestly, other than like fanciful, oh, we're going to drive him out of Clark Field, we're going to take Manila and we're going to liberate Luzon. Like, realistically, I think best case scenario at this point is that he panics and he brings reinforcements into Luzon. He may need them, in, in all honesty, to hold the base. We don't, I think most of his units in Manila are support, and we don't really know how, what, how good a shape his two divisions are in. 
Um, so it is possible that we could drive him back, but I, I think it's going to be a tough ask for us. My main hope is that he pulls a division that was bound for somewhere else and puts it in the Philippines to try and, you know, reduce us more quickly now that we've given him a bit of a, of a bloody nose here. We do have a couple of ships up north here. Just uh, looks like they might be unloading supplies or something at Ilba. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to order our uh, PBY Catalinas here. Uh, to go ahead and maybe do like a thousand foot, whoops, uh, maybe do like a thousand foot, um, do actually, by the way, can we, I don't know if I actually want to put, do this. Um, we have an air HQ here, don't we? Not that. I thought we have an air HQ. That's naval. No, I guess we don't. I was gonna say it'd be nice to throw some uh, torpedoes in, so we could we could use our Catalinas to bomb with torpedoes. But it doesn't look like I've got that as an option. So I think we'll just have to uh, have to order a, a a bombing attack with just using bombs, I suppose. And um, we will go ahead and set the altitude down to 1,000 feet to do a skip bombing attack. And who knows? Maybe we'll have, we'll have some success against some Japanese shipping in the area. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of the troops are going to pursue, uh, and we'll see how things uh, play out. Now, if he keeps bombing me with dive bombers, just for what it's worth, it's going to slow me down. I might never get to Clark Field. If he slows me down too much, it might be like a week for us to get there. So we'll see. But again, got to keep got to keep the pressure up as much as we can. So we will advance on Clark Field. We'll see if we can uh, knock his troops back again, and we'll go from there. Um, that was the big update. The other thing is obviously that the Japanese did land on Java. You can see actually they landed south of Java at Denzapur uh, with uh, about 1,500 troops. We've just got a base force unit there with a couple of rifle, actually no rifle squads. Uh, we do have, I think, one B-17 that's probably going to get swept up when he attacks and takes the base this turn because it is under repair. Uh, meanwhile, he did also land at Semarang, where we all we have is a base force as well. He landed about 9,000 troops on this first turn. It also looks like he does have the Mini Kitty Butai based out of, or like in, in the area of Semarang. I'm not sure why he would move the Mini Kitty Butai inshore. That's pretty damn risky if we had any mines or anything like that, that he would get hit by that, but... Apparently not. So he did land a fair amount of troops there. We don't have any air units there that are going to get hurt. I don't know why my uh, my bombers didn't fly against him. I, I did order the um, B-25s and, and the B-20s here, the DV-7s, which are, which are Boston's, to launch a naval attack against him at, at skip bombing altitude, but they apparently they didn't fly. So not sure about that. Uh, they're not fatigued or anything like that. The aircraft are all ready, so that's a little bit annoying. They're not very well trained. They'll probably all die, but I would, I would like them to try and attack some of his naval forces in the area, please, um, because that would be nice, okay? Also, he did bomb Sorabaya. Uh, you can see here we did lose a few units that are sort of knocked out of commission, or not knocked out, but damaged here on the ground. Um, well, so if we take a look at the air losses last turn, it looks like we didn't lose, we lost three aircraft on the field, four air to air, five op losses. This is saying he lost five op losses, two to flak. So if we take a look here, it says four SB3s, which are the aircraft that were bombing in China that he intercepted. So that makes sense. It says he lost two Sonyas to flak, two Sally's to ops losses. We lost two Catalinas, one in air to air, one op loss. Um, and you can see here a Skytrain law op loss. I don't actually see what was lost on the ground. One Hudson, one CW-22, and one 139WH3. Okay. Um, any planes in survey able to bomb? Yeah, in theory. So we've got a fair number of Hudsons or uh, whatnot. We've got about 27 aircraft. They're all currently set to search. But we could tr we could set these guys to uh, to naval attack. I'll have to think about that. The main they're not going to do a lot, but maybe they'd overwhelm a cap. Uh, most likely they're just going to give them free kills. But who knows? Um, meanwhile, our fighter aircraft in uh, Batavia, how are they doing? We were given a couple days off to try and 
get them repaired. It looks like the Hurricanes are almost back up to full strength. Nine of the ten aircraft are ready for combat. So we could throw them up on a patrol, but they're probably going to get shot to pieces by all those zeros if he keeps flying like 30 plus zeros through on sweeps. The Warhawks are still lagging behind. You can see uh, their aircraft are... Where, what am I clicking on? Their aircraft are... Well, a bunch of them will be ready tomorrow, but I don't know that we can wait. I think we're going to have to throw the war the Hurricanes up on cap because if he flew sweeps over Batavia and we weren't we weren't rising to meet him, I'm sure he's going to take advantage of that and maybe try and bomb the airfield, and we don't want to lose all those aircraft on the ground. So we'll have to take a look at that. Meanwhile, we have gotten about half of the Gull Battalion out of, uh, can, uh, out of Kolak. So you can see, well, not in terms of load cost, but at least in terms of combat value, there's about 17 infantry squads that are left of the Gull Battalion, which is a pretty good Australian battalion of infantry here. Uh, you can see if we scroll through here, we've got 18 assault value of the Gull Battalion now in Batavia, 12 infantry sections, two Brens, two combat engineers, two Vickers, two uh, actually five uh, two-pound anti-tank guns and four Lewis anti-aircraft machine guns, two three-inch mortars, and six support. The, that only equates to about 328 of its, or actually 382 of its total load cost. But the, of the units that are left, almost all of that load cost is sort of tied up in support, I think. Uh, six support, uh, 12, or actually no, that's the TO, total TOE. It doesn't even show me what they have there. Oh, maybe it does. Huh. I guess I'm misreading that. In any event, you can see here that um, about half the infantry sections have, have pulled back to Batavia. That'll be a nice, useful little section in terms of defending Batavia. Um, not a lot else to show here. Sorry. they're coming. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of enemy ships here. Uh, we've got something moving southeast. Uh, we've got these destroyers moving in some undeterminate direction. Uh, southwest for this formation of troop transports and light cruisers and minesweepers. I suppose they could be moving toward Kaljaliti to try and accelerate the invasion of Java, but I suspect they're going to be moving in towards Semarang. It says southwest. That would technically be southwest. I would expect them to have one main landing to bring in the rest of the division, probably. Um, and uh, that's kind of where we're at. I don't see a lot of other shipping in the area. One thing I am going to do is I do have some patrol boats up in Batavia. We've got two sections of three, so I'm going to swing both of those south towards Semarang. Hopefully those cruisers and the other warships have used up a lot of their uh, naval gunfire ammunition in attacking Semarang itself and bombarding the base. So my hope, and this is maybe unrealistic, but my hope is by the time those PT boats arrive in the south, that one, it's daytime so they can get a little bit better visibility and close and, and maybe get some torpedoes in because the Japanese always kick our ass at night. And two, that the Japanese have expended most of their guns and maybe they can be a little bit more effective. Maybe they'll catch a troop transport or something like that anchored and be able to put some torpedoes into them. We'll see. But I do have those patrol boat formations moving south. The two patrol boats from the group that was engaged are moving north primarily because I think it looks like they did fire their torpedoes. So they're all out of torpedo ammunition. So they're going to need to pull back to uh, somewhere where they can replenish. They won't be able to replenish here. They'll have to go up to Batavia. But they don't have the fuel to get to Batavia or Sur Surabaja, so uh, we'll have to see how, how that works. Yeah, I mean, I suppose he could go for a second beachhead, but if he does it, it doesn't really help him at all because we've already pulled back pretty much everything that can be pulled back. Um, the one exception is the, uh, I guess, this Air HQ, which I suppose I will go ahead and send north to Batavia now via rail. So well, those guys are already set to strat move. There's not really any other troops. There's just a couple of base force units, a couple of static units that aren't allowed to move um, that are sort of in the south. So he's not. there's nothing for him to cut off if he lands up north here. Uh, maybe, Sean, but, I mean, I can't – we'll see where they <sighs> – I guess at the, uh, it doesn't really matter. There's nothing I can do at this point at the current range to keep them hidden as they close in and arrive at night. So they're going to die or they're not going to die. But there's nothing I can really do to make them attack at, at, at night. Um, okay, so that's the situation down there. Meanwhile, we did have 75 additional aviation support arrive at Rangoon. Um, you can see here it is the 221 RAF group. 
They're still unloading a couple of units from them, just really observer core units. Uh, so they're kind of like not radars, but like, I guess, coast watchers. The rest of the unit is already unloaded. Not that here. So you can see we got 75 additional aviation support into Rangoon. That gives us a little bit of a buffer on our aviation support. It actually allows us to have up to 197 aircraft based there. We only have 127. It also means that I moved some of my aviation support units out to Mandalay to support the bombers which were moving in there. So we did move the 225, or we started moving elements of the 225 group wing out of India via air transport into Mandalay. We did move the AVG group at ground echelon as well. Uh, and so we now have a little bit of a buffer in terms of aviation support at Mandalay. Before we were running short, now we've got 82 aviation support with 48 aircraft needing that support. That should help us in our air operations and in getting those P-38s up and running. We are trying to upgrade the field to level 4 to kind of help the strategic bombing, which is going to occur out of Mandalay uh, whenever, whenever the moment comes, uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, but you can see here we've got some uh, P-38 Lightnings that are, are working on getting uh, ready. You, we've got 18 of them now, nine more are being repaired. And then we have some uh, five more B-17s that need to be repaired and brought up to snuff. Uh, when they all do get ready, we'll have 21 17s. Uh, that are ready to bomb Burma. We can also move some of our other bombers out of Lido uh, into uh, into uh, Mandalay. So I can move these five B-17s into Mandalay now. So we'll do that. And then the other three, as they, as they get repaired, will be brought in as well. Uh, that aircraft actually will be ready tomorrow. So one of them was damaged in the transfer. The other three are left behind, but they should be ready in two days. So we should have another eight B-17s at Mandalay getting us just shy of 30 B-17s to hit him when he does start moving into Burma, although we have no indication that he's ready to do that quite yet. No strat bombing rules, Southern, so I think we can do whatever we want to do with our B-17s. Uh, the only rules really have to do with, like, four-engine bombers out of, a, out of an undersized airfield have to do attacks at extended range, which basically cuts their payloads in half. Oh yeah, there are there are strat rule bombing rules in China. So um, Japan can't like attack resources because it's really easy to starve units out and that kind of stuff. But nothing that matters for us anyway in Burma. I, I don't have any strat bombing going on in China. We should stop those S three B units, by the way. So we're just gonna stand all these guys down because you can see these guys got shot up pretty good here. Nope, no restrictions on low altitude four engine uh, heavy bomber attacks. So we are allowed to do that. Um, skip bombing as well is also allowed. Uh, all right, these guys, were they bombing here? No, they're set to recon. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could also use my bombers to hit Bangkok. I'm not, I don't think they'd have the range from Mandalay to get there right now. Range would be 16. I don't know that I, I think I don't know if you can attack at extended range when you're on an airfield that's too small. So my my older B-17s, um, the what are these guys? The B-17Ds could make the attack, but I don't think my E's could. Now it looks like most of my aircraft are are E's, but we do have some uh, we do have some or sorry D's, but we do have some E's which are slightly shorter ranged. So we'd have, to, we'd have to see how that would work out. Meanwhile, we do have the 7th Aussie Division that is on its way, and it did divert north to, become, to, to keep itself a little bit safer from Japanese air attack, which is actually kind of a bad thing because it, it means it's going to take a little bit longer for them to get into port. I'm kind of wondering if we should just flank speed them in. That gives them four movement per uh, phase. They're not detected yet. There's no detection on these guys and they're in thunderstorms and actually the thunderstorm front is supposed to stay over Rangoon for another turn. So that would help cover them up. If we move them at four, that's one, two, three, four. So this is where they'll be when the a the day phase starts. One, two, three, four. So at the end of the turn, then they'd be able to get into port before the morning of the next turn. So I think that's what we'll do. Um, and then there's plenty of fuel to use in Rangoon. Rangoon is actually a fuel source because Burma produces some oil that gets refined. So any use of fuel there is actually good for us because it'll 
accelerate the uh or i guess it'll use up fuel that otherwise will eventually go to the japanese when they take rangoon so i'm fine with that uh, bangkok would be a hub for an invasion route yeah um i can't destroy the rail depot which would be the most important thing to destroy uh, i'm not sure if if bombing the city itself would really matter a whole lot destroying the oil would be a good thing to do uh long term it would it would hurt the japanese economy as well um so if we take a look at batavia itself we are up to 79 uh, percent of the way to level four fortifications it still feels like we're only moving at like one a day so i don't know that we're ever going to get to four but it would be real great if we could get to four we do have some defensive mines as well in the event that he decides he wants to try and bombard batavia there's a chance he could run into some allied mines not sure if he will or not uh try and do that we don't have a lot of mines there so again we're pursuing at batan we are dealing with the invasion of java uh and we are landing some troops at coast coast islands we're landing two Australian uh, battalions, pioneer battalions. These are good units, good troops that we are unloading here. We've got some supply coming with them as well. I want to build a little bit of a barrier here to hold Coast Coast Island to make sure that he can't use his G3M Nels to kind of cut off our, our supply north and south between India and Australia. Um, I've already, I'm pretty sure I've already ordered my supplies to all be sucked into Batavia. I've already maxed out the supplies required. We've pulled 60,000 supply in there. There is a little bit of supply elsewhere, but I've already, I mean, I've, I think I've pulled almost all my supply into Batavia already. So the one thing with Batavia is it is exposed to enemy naval bombardments that, uh, that he could, you know, kind of nuke us with his, with his naval bombardments. But um, it's a, it's a better place to hold out, I think, at its fort level than like trying to pull into a mid hex base like Banjong, which is a, a mountain hex, which would give us a better defensive bonus. Um, but he could just sit up. I'd rather him have to hit commit forces to try and take Batavia quickly than leave like one brigade behind to just hold us in place indefinitely. Uh, shoo, I can't lay any more mines at Batavia, unfortunately. Uh, not with his air power that he's exercising in the region. I did have a mine layer that, or a set of mine layers that were on their way to lay a minefield at uh, at Semarang, actually, but uh, that didn't play out. Uh, they've got what 135 mines on the on board, so we are going to divert them to Coscos Islands to give a little bit of protection to these pioneer battalions which are dropping there. Um, can I move the Merc base force to Batavia? Which base force? The guys up here? Um, I mean, they'll retreat there eventually. Um, I don't really see the point of moving. I guess I'll move these guys just because there's no point in having two base force units there. But, um... I'm not going to I'm not going to leave one of these these bases completely exposed where it's like here land here unopposed even though I don't really have any real realistic chance of of stopping him. I don't want him to see it's completely unopposed. Uh all right. So we're still trying to pull some of these troops out, right? Where are we where are we pulling them into Cairns, I think. So the second, fourth, independence, what about the 53rd Australian Battalion is up to nine assault value and 373 load cost. The, that's apparently everything. What are, we're pulling something else out, aren't we? Oh no, so we finished. So we've got to switch over and start pulling out a, a new unit, I guess. So we'll probably work on the 44th Indian Brigade, I would guess. Meh, maybe not. Maybe we should do the Port Moresby Brigade. They've got more CMF sections, so they're probably worth keeping around. Plus, they're elements of the Port Moresby Brigade if we do want to stack them up with the other uh, New Guinea rifle sections that are out of there. So we'll probably go ahead and start pulling elements of the Port Moresby Brigade out. Although we could do the 45th Indian Brigade. That's actually got 84 Indian rifle sections. We might want to pull them out instead. We'll have to see. 
the Gull Battalion further north, you mean? Can we ambush the bombers that have been bombing troops near Moresby? Um, not really. I don't have the fighter range. Unfortunately, our fighters on the Australian coast or on Horn Island don't have the range to provide a cap over Moresby, so no real way to ambush them. Meanwhile, if we take a look at our carriers, by the way, thanks for the follow, Freedom Fighter 2003. Um, you can see our carriers are in the process of moving to the west coast of Australia. They're rebasing there. We do have some tankers down there. They're going to replenish these guys. And then we'll see if we want to sprint the carriers north uh, to India or maybe helping out in Java. I don't know. Um, the Hornet is almost to Pearl Harbor. She's on the way. Not really southern. I moved most of my bombers out of Australia and moved them to Burma. So I, I really don't have any way to kind of keep bombing Moresby. It was kind of a trade-off. Um, so I think... I mean, I don't... Let's take a look, I guess, at SIGINT. Anything interesting here? Construction companies loaded on transports moving to Lunga. Uh, yeah, not a lot of super interesting stuff in SIGINT. Weather report, Rangoon is going to remain thunderstorms. At least that's the report. So that should be good for us. Clear skies over the Dutch East Indies, which isn't great for us. Rain over southern Australia where the carriers are. So if there's any subs, it makes it harder for them to spot us, which is good. And, uh, yeah, that's the weather report. In terms of intelligence, where are we at with those ground troops arriving yet? I think we're like six days away from those heavy ground reinforcements. Five days away from these three British brigades arriving in the Middle East, as well as some British divisions and Indian divisions arriving as well. Oh, one other thing that did happen, which I don't know if I'll do this turn or not, but um, we did have enough. We do have enough political points now. So there's two divisions that can be unlocked currently in Los Angeles: the 40th and the 27th. The 40th is much more powerful, but what that means is it costs substantially more. It costs 2,300 to unlock. So what we may do shortly is the 27th Infantry Division, which is about 100 assault value weaker because we have its replacements turned off. It does have the ability to be just as powerful, but we have its replacements turned off, so it's not drawing any replacements. Um, so it is actually cheaper to switch its headquarters. And so we do have the political points to unlock the 27th Infantry Division and assign it essentially wherever we want, Southwest Pacific, South Pacific, Pacific Fleet, whatever we want to assign the division to. And then we can turn its replacements on so it starts drawing replacements and uh, becomes a powerful division. Uh, so that's something we may look at doing but that is good news for us because then we can deploy the 27th uh, wherever we want, really. So we could deploy it to Fiji. We could deploy it to Australia. We could throw it on transports and spend 45 days as it tries to make its way toward India or Burma, um, you know, depending on, on the situation there when it arrives. But uh, but that's nice. So uh, we'll, we'll see about that. Um, and other than that... Not a lot of other updates this turn. So big battle in Bataan. That was sort of the big update. And then also the Japanese invasion of Java has begun. So both of those are important events that have occurred. And uh, that's where we're at. So, yeah. Anyway. Um, kind of a short, short uh, I, I don't know. These are always about an hour. Let's go ahead and save this. And that's all I got for you guys tonight. So thanks, guys, for coming out. Hope you guys enjoyed the stream. Thank you for the new followers. Tremor01, thank you for the, uh, for the sub. And I hope you guys enjoyed the episode and the turn. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer. Uh, this game is like one turn. Uh, yeah, so this is one turn is one day to answer your questions. So uh, we can take a look at uh, future ships and whatever, I guess. 
So every turn equals one day. Every single unit is modeled basically at a battalion level or above. There are some companies that are also modeled. Every single ship in the Pacific Theater of Operations during World War II is modeled. And uh, every turn is one day throughout World War II. So you can play versus the AI, which lets you play much more quickly. You can play against humans who turn turns around much more quickly. But since this is obviously a YouTube series and this isn't my full-time thing, uh, or, nor, or, or the focus of my channel exclusively, uh, it does take a while to get through in a series like this. You can see the Repulse is 42 days away, the Prince of Wales 252, and um, does the Repulse get a refit? Not till 43. The Prince of Wales... Oh, we already told it to refit, so it must be in the process of refitting, I guess. Uh, no, that's one of two upgrades. So that doesn't upgrade till 43. In any event. Open Hornet 2 and click the name and change it to Historical Gamer. Uh, remind me to do that next time, Pat. I'll, I'll change that. Uh, I'll change that later. Anyway, guys, hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I'm out.